talking to you today a little bit about some of my uh, doctoral dissertation work, particularly trying to uncover a few interesting things about the life history of cephalopods using this technique, uh, using stable isotopes to get some idea about that. So before I go too much into that specifically, I need to tell you why in the world would you ever even care about cephalopods in the first place, other than them being really amazingly cool. I'll give you a little bit more than that. And one of the first things is that cephalopods are actually way more abundant than most people realize. Some estimates of the number or the biomass of cephalopods in the oceans puts them at about somewhere in the neighborhood of equal biomass with all the fish in the ocean, which is a lot. This is making them incredibly important to the ecosystems that they're in. Also, they're, they're really important to all these marine food webs that they're found in. They have no bones, there's lots of protein in there, so they make really good food for just about anything that has the ability to catch them. So they're really important as prey animals, specifically to marine mammals. There's many, many whales whose primary diet, like this sperm whale here, is cephalopods. Also, a lot of large fishes, uh, oceanic birds, um, and so there's a lot of things that depend heavily on cephalopods. But then also as predators. And so they're often all, well, excuse me, all cephalopods are obligate predators. And so a lot of them are doing a lot to shape their communities. Specifically octopuses in a lot of benthic communities can change their diet or will readily change their diet depending on prey abundance and do this in such a way that helps shape the communities uh, the animal communities that they're in. So this is, they play these really important roles. So, now that's, that's a lot of good ecological reasons to want to care about what happens to cephalopods and what they're doing. But another thing here is that they're important to humans. So if we look at the landings of cephalopods since 1970, it's actually risen quite a bit. It's, it's gone up about fourfold how many we are catching during that time. Now you might think, well, you know what, we're catching a lot of things. We're catching more fish in general. Well, if you look at actually just their makeup of the, the percentage of fisheries that we're landing, that's increasing as well. And so cephalopods are making this increasingly important part of the economic um, surplus that we're gaining from the ocean. So for all these reasons, cephalopods are very important to what we're However, that being said, we know incredibly little about cephalopods, what they're doing in the ocean, what's happening over the course of their lifetime. And part of this has to do with, well, unlike whales and stuff, they don't come up for air, they're hard to tag, they're hard to kind of figure out what they're doing and where they're going. And so despite all of this importance, we know relatively very little about them compared to the other major components of oceanic systems, like fish, like marine mammals, like things like that. So the major, one of the major thrusts of my doctoral research is trying to find a way that we can rectify a little bit of this, this gap in knowledge that we have. And I was interested in bringing this idea of stable isotope analysis to bear on that. Now, before I get too much into that, I need to tell you a little bit about what is going on with stable isotope analysis. And what we're doing with this is we're looking at relative abundances of stable isotopes. You'll probably recall, maybe, maybe vaguely in the back of your mind, but isotopes are just the same type of element, but we have different numbers of neutrons. So essentially it's the same element, but one is slightly heavier, one slightly lighter than the other. And if we get too many extra neutrons, we can actually make the atom unstable, and that's what we call a radioactive isotope. But if we just add a few, or few enough, they'll stay stable, they won't break down. And this is stable isotopes, and this is particularly what we'll be looking at. And so for my work, I was particularly interested in looking at the stable isotope ratios of nitrogen, which is nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 14, nitrogen 15 being the rare isotope, and then also carbon 13 to carbon 12, which carbon 13 is a rare isotope, carbon 12 is the common one, and we use this notation that I put up right here, which is a delta notation that we commonly use to uh, communicate these ratios. To kind of give you just a, a really brief idea of what that delta notation means, it, it, we derive it from this big crazy equation, don't worry too much about this, 
essentially what we're doing is we're taking the ratio of one isotope to another in a sample, dividing it by some standard that we have predetermined is, is the standard, subtract that from one, multiply that by a thousand. But all of this is really just to say this delta notation is just a tenth of a percent difference in relative amounts of these isotopes from some standard that we've just pulled out. So really, if we have positive numbers for this delta amount, it's just we have more of the rare isotope than some standard does, and less means we just have uh, less of this, this rare isotope. So don't worry too much about that. Really, we're just going to be using this as a marker for various things as we go through. Now, just kind of for, uh, just to let you know, standards that we use, because we are comparing this to a standard, for carbon, we're using PD bolemnite formation, uh, carbon from that. This carbon is, or this formation is actually a formation, I think this is really appropriate, of fossilized cephalopods that, uh, that we, can, we can dig up. And we're using the carbon from that because the carbon isotope ratio in that is very consistent. We're using that. And for nitrogen, there happens to be a ton of nitrogen in the atmosphere, and it's well mixed. And so we use atmospheric nitrogen as our standard isotope ratios uh, for that. Now, so we're looking at differences in these isotope ratios, but we need to figure out how in the world do these differences arise in the first place. And if you're a heterotrophic organism, so if you're eating other organisms, it's pretty simple. You're getting these from what you eat. Unlike autotrophs like plants and stuff like that, they'll get it from the atmosphere, fix it that way. We're getting everything from what we eat. So in terms of carbon, your carbon stable isotope signature, those ratios of isotopes in you look very much like whatever you ate. So what you've been eating for the past couple months, depending on how long that tissue was turned over, is going to be very similar to what's in you. However, this is not the case in nitrogen. In nitrogen, you will eat something that has some sort of nitrogen in it, and you're going to metabolize some of that nitrogen. And you are going to preferentially pee out the nitrogen-14. It's going to leave your body. However, the nitrogen-15 is going to preferentially stay in your body. And what that means is that you tend to be about 3.3 per mil higher in your delta 15N than whatever you ate was. So this is actually a really good tool for trying to figure out at what trophic level you're at. Because you're going to be 3 per mil about higher than whatever you ate, which is going to be 3 per mil higher than whatever it ate and all the way down. So we can kind of tell how high of a predator is it that we're looking at here. Another way that we get variation in these stable isotopes is actually if you look geographically, there are, are just natural occurring variations geographically as well. And so these are things that we call isoscapes. If we look at just the, um, the nitrogen signature in nitrate in the water across the ocean, we get very, very high um, variations in this with latitude. With, at mid-latitudes, we're getting very low values of nitrogen-15. And as we move towards the poles, that increases quite a bit. So we can also get some idea about where something has been based on these stable isotope ratios as well. And so we have this occurring both in nitrogen and in carbon. We have these nice geographic variations that are going to entrain some of that variation in what we're looking at as well. Now, so you're, in, you're, you're putting this into your body. You're taking these, these um, atoms and incorporating them into your own tissues. But what time period that reflects in terms of what you eat is going to have something to do about what tissue you like look at. And so this is going to be kind of an average signature over, over the time period that that tissue is turned over. So for instance, if we look at something like your blood, your blood's turned over relatively quickly, the stable isotope signature in your blood is going to reflect your very recent diet. If we go to something else like your liver, your skin, that's turned over less quickly, and so that's going to reflect an average of your diet over a longer period of time. If we look at your muscle, your, the, the atomic structure of your muscle is being turned over much, much more slowly, and so that's going to essentially give you an average of a much longer period of time. And so that's kind of interesting, but the problem is with all of these, all these metabolically active tissues, is they're giving you an average over some period of time, and that can give you some muddled results. 
And so if I ate something that had some particular stable isotope signature in it yesterday, but had something very different three days ago and something very different four days ago, all of that's going to kind of get mixed together and muddled in these metabolically active tissues because all of that's averaging out. What we were really interested in looking in is archival tissues. Archival tissues are different in that once they are laid down, once they're formed, there's not any metabolic activity in them to turn over the atoms that are in that tissue there. And so what this means is that when they are formed, it's going to give you this snapshot of the stable isotope ratios of the diet of that animal, maybe slightly altered, like what we were saying with nitrogen, that you get this change. So there might be some change, but it's going to give you a snapshot of what was happening in that animal at the time that tissue was formed. So for instance, in you, your hair, your fingernails, things like this, once you make those tissues, you don't turn them over anymore. And that's going to give us a snapshot of what you were eating at the time those tissues were formed. In other animals, things like whale baleen plates or teeth, if we're talking about sperm whales, act the same way. Vertebrae and sharks, we can do the, the same thing with. And also fish otoliths, these, um, these uh, calcareous structures in their head that help them here. We can also use those, and these give us these nice snapshots, because once, once they're laid down, that stable isotope ratio is going to be frozen into place and really help us get a good idea of what they're eating when that formed. And so really, a big part of what I was doing for my PhD was looking for a good archival tissue that we could use in cephalopods. Something that we could use to break down what they were eating and where they were at at these different time points during their life and help to really try to address these problems that we have of not really knowing what goes on with these cephalopods. And so we considered a few different tissues. Now this was kind of hard because like I said, cephalopods don't really have many hard tissues. They're mostly muscle and skin and blood and connective tissue and stuff like that. There's not much that is hard in them, so there's not much to choose from. So the first thing that we looked at is beaks. Turns out cephalopods have this chitinous beak that looks a lot like a parrot beak. And once those are made, once the tissue in that's laid down, it's, it's not turned over. We, we decided to take a look at these to try to see what we could use with that. Didn't really work too well because... Unfortunately, we couldn't separate time periods very well in beaks. They, they have a very complex morphology to them, and it makes it very difficult to separate out what tissues or what parts of that were made very recently and what were made very long ago. So that made that difficult. We also looked at pens. Now, um, a lot of different cephalopods have some sort of, on their dorsal side, have some hard structure that they create. Uh, like in squid, this is a pen that runs along their back that helps give them some sort of rigidity in cuttlefish. They have a cuddle bone, and we considered using these. We ran to the same problem that we had with beaks. We were not able to separate out all distinct time periods very well. And the other problem is not all cephalopods have these. And when they are, they're made out of different things. And this makes it really hard to get some uniform comparison across all cephalopods. It makes it very hard. It'll be a, a something, a technique that we could use for this group, but not for this other group. And then we might be able to use it for this other group, the cuttlefish, but we'd have to probably change the methods because it's made out of a different material. So this probably wasn't going to work very well as our tissue. Cephalopods also have this little calcium carbonate structure inside their head called a statolith. This is just kind of a, a small calcium carbonate stone that they form. It sits in a little uh, chamber that has hair cells on it that as it falls down to the bottom, it knows which way it's up. But the problem with this is these are tiny. This little thing right here that you're seeing, in case you can't see this right there, that came from a four-foot squid. A four-foot, 80-pound squid gave us that satellite. I'm working with octopuses that are about the size of my fist. This isn't going to work so well. So, uh, some people have really tried to do this, have really tried to make these stylists work because there's some really good things about them. We can really separate out time periods really nicely if you can see them. And good for them. They spend their entire lives looking under microscopes trying to get little bands on these and, oh, okay. Whatever, whatever makes you happy was not where I wanted to go with that. So, what we 
finally settled on was using eye lenses. There is this, this tissue that is laid down, and once it's laid down, it's not going to be turned over metabolically. And they're actually fairly large. Cephalopods have pretty big eyes, especially compared to vertebrates of the same size. This is an eye lens, not, mind you, not an eye, just the eye lens of a squid that probably weighed about a third of what I do. And it's bigger than, or about the same size maybe, a little bit smaller than my eye. It is huge. And so this seemed to be a really good uh, thing to use. So let's talk a little bit about what made them such a nice tissue to start picking out uh, stable isotope history of these animals. One thing I should point out first, though, is that they're not formed the same way that your eyes were. In fact, cephalopod eyes have, have a completely different evolutionary lineage to yours. Our common ancestors did not have eyes. They have arrived at this completely independently. What that means is that their, their lens is forming very differently. They have two different lenses that are smashed together, essentially. They have this anterior chamber and this posterior chamber. So if I go back here, you can kind of see uh, one chamber here and then kind of offset is this other chamber because this poor island is coming apart in this. But we have these two different hemispheres that are smashed together and make up the entire islands. And that's kind of why I'm showing this animation here that I'm coming apart somewhat. And the anterior side, so this is the one that's facing the environment, is a lot thinner and smaller than the posterior side of that. But this makes it very nice because we can separate out these two hemispheres very easily without having to do a lot of cutting. And then once you get in there, the really nice thing is that they're made up of layers. Layers that were laid down this daily fashion. So they're kind of like this really fine layered onion that we can just start pulling apart. You don't need any special equipment for this. It's easy, something that you can do out in the field. I can put undergraduates or volunteers on pulling apart these different islands layers and it's actually pretty simple, pretty straightforward. I don't have to get any special equipment for them to do. I can just sit them down with a couple of needles and a scalpel, and off they go. And so it makes it this really, really nice sampling procedure that we can get very distinct time periods of the history of this animal. Tissues that were made over its entire lifetime, and we can separate them out really easily. So we had found a really nice archival tissue that we can start to look at the history of these animals. So now I'm going to take you on and tell you one specific story that we addressed with this. I had about three of these that I did in my dissertation, but I'm going to take you through one specific one that has fairly big impacts for what's happening here in the Pacific Northwest, particularly on our coasts. And what we're interested in, and what I was interested in at this point, is What's happening with these really big squid that are showing up all of a sudden on our coast? These things called Humboldt squid that just are coming out of nowhere. Well, not nowhere. They came out of uh, very, very south U.S., Mexico, uh, Central America, South America coast. And all of a sudden, they're showing up here in Oregon, in Washington, all the way up to Alaska. We were finding some of these and what happened. So we had a squid invasion on. These Humboldt squid, also called Decidicus gigas, is their scientific name. I'll, excuse me, if I go back and forth between Humboldt squid, squid and Decidicus, I'll, I'll try to keep it uniform, but I think I've, I've interchanged them a little bit in this, in this talk. Uh, but I'm talking about the same thing. That's a picture of one from underneath. These are large squid. How They're, large? How large? Oh, good thing that you asked. Let me tell you how large. <laughs> they can get up to about two and a half meters. Total length, so a little bit longer than me at full size. Up to about 50 kilograms, lighter than me. Well, maybe I'm 50 kilograms. No, no, that's lighter. <laughs> I'm losing weight. No. Uh, so up to about 50 kilograms, which is, for a squid, this is, this is really heavy. And so they're these very large squid. In fact, I think right now for weight, they are the fourth largest squid that we know about after the colossal squid, the giant squid, the robust club hook squid. Crazy name because no one ever sees them. And then the Humboldt squid. So they are, they are very large. And they can have very bad consequences for things they come because they're voracious predators. They have about a one year lifespan. They get to this size over the course of a single year and then die off. So they have these incredibly high growth rates. Which, makes, which means these are also incredibly hungry animals. 
If you are growing that much in a single year, you need to eat a lot to maintain that kind of growth rate. And so them going anywhere they're not supposed to be is not good news. They're occurring in surface water, so they'll come right up to the surface, but they can exist down to about 2,300 feet, which is pretty deep. About a half mile down is not nothing to sneeze, sneeze about. And when they come north, they're coming north in very large groups. They travel in kind of loose aggregations, loose shoals, that can be up into the thousands of individuals. Needless to say, thousands, groups of thousands of very hungry squid moving into the Pacific Northwest is not something we necessarily want to see, especially when, you know, hey, we like things that are a bit smaller than them, like salmon, other stuff like that. Uh, so this, is, this, this isn't good, but we didn't know exactly what was going on, where they're coming from, how they're coming from. There. There's a lot we don't know about these. We need to solve quite a bit of that. Also, this is a squid that's become economically important globally over the last 20 years. So this is the annual landings in 100 thousands of metric tons per year of Humboldt squid. You can see before 1990, we didn't care about them. We weren't uh, doing anything with that. But since 90, people have gotten this taste for ginormous calamari rings, apparently. <laughs> Actually, we don't make calamari rings. You'll see them as steaks. If you, if you go like into the store and they're selling squid steaks, that's what this is. That's what you're getting. And you'll see that it's just skyrocketed to this point. So to now we're, we're catching somewhere in the neighborhood of 800,000 or, yeah, 800,000 metric tons every year of them, which is a lot, but let me put that into perspective for you. Uh, chicken of the sea, albacore tuna, we're getting somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000 metric tons every year, so significantly less than what we're getting right now for Humboldt squid. Let's take a look at all the common salmon that we eat. So chinook, chum, coho, pink, sockeye salmon, all of those put together is about the same as what we're landing right now in Humboldt squid globally. Another one, another one, Atlantic cod. This used to get put in everything, like fish sticks and, and general whitefish that were getting from the ocean used to be one of the hugest, largest um, fisheries in the world. We've got tons of them. They've crashed in recent years, but they've actually come down. They're still a huge fishery but we're catching about as many Humboldt squid as we are catching Atlantic cod. So economically, they come, become kind of important as well. One of the big reasons for this is because of that crash of Atlantic cod and other fisheries. They're absolutely crashing. We need other protein sources from the ocean. This is kind of tragic, but then we start eating things like Humboldt squid. They're not that bad. I've had a couple of them. They're okay, but yeah, wouldn't be my first choice. So historically, if you look back in, in things published around 1979, that's 1976, never mind, upside down. Um, we had a range of these right about like this. They occur almost all the way down to the southern tip uh, of uh, South America, up through Central America and Mexico, and then terminating just up close to the uh, southern U.S. border. But that's how far we knew them from. And this is from a lot of fishing in North America. We had a good idea that they weren't here. However... Uh, up to just a few years ago, we started seeing stuff like this, where we were getting expansion of their range, not only further out from shore, but more uh, northward as well, extending up into California, Oregon, Washington. They've been uh, beaching themselves up in Vancouver Island. They've caught some in Alaska. So this is an incredible northward move into habitats that have previously never seen Humboldt squid before. before. And this, this is not particularly good. So it's good to ask, well, why in the world is this happening? Why would they be moving north? And the first thing that will pop into most people's head is, hey, it's a tropical species coming northward. Global warming is getting hotter. You know, we're getting more tropical-like environments farther and farther north. And that's probably not directly the case. Here, it actually turns out that, at least directly, temperature doesn't seem to be the, the issue here, because adults are really well adapted to low temperatures. They go down to 2,300 feet, which is cold. It gets down regularly, hanging around 2 degrees Celsius, is barely above freezing, and they are fine down there. So surface waters up around the Pacific Northwest have not been the problem. The temperature has not been the problem. So what was it? As it turns out that these animals are really tied to this phenomenon known as the oxygen minimum zone. 
And the oxygen minimum zone is expanding. And these animals seem to be following that. So let's talk a little bit about what in the world is the oxygen minimum zone. Well, if we look at the, the profile of what's happening in the ocean, you see something like this, nice blue, it's a sunny day out there in the mid ocean. At the very top, we get this, this water that's well mixed with the, with the surface. So temperature is kind of similar to the surface area, the oxygen level is similar to the surface area. But as you go down, we start getting colder and darker and things like this. And so there turns out there's this point where you get a change from fairly warm water to much colder water. It's a very sudden transition. And that's called the thermocline. But it actually turns out that the water density also changes because colder water is denser than, than cooler water. So you get a density change there. We call that the pycnocline, the density change. They really generally occur right about the same spot. But what this means is that because we have these differences in temperature and density, the water up here in the top does not mix very well with the water down below. We don't get much mixing at all. So whatever's in the top tends to stay in the top, whatever's in the bottom stays in the bottom. And up here in the top, where it's all light and nice, we have phytoplankton and zooplankton, this all very nice ecosystem that's deriving all this energy from the sun, and everything's going all swimmingly up there. But things die, that happens. As these things die, they start getting consumed by bacteria, they start floating down in the water column. And we start to get um, this bacteria that's consuming them, is consuming oxygen as well. And what we get is just below the thermal pickle line, and sometimes well below, sometimes just below it, we get an area of very low oxygen. It's been consumed out of there, and it's not being mixed very well. Now at the very bottom, things are okay because we have deep currents down here. They're carrying oxygen in horizontally, and so this is well oxygenated, the surface is well oxygenated, but we have this area right in the middle that is very, very low oxygen. This is the oxygen minimum zone. It doesn't occur everywhere in the, on, on Earth, just places that tend to be very high production of this phytoplankton and these plankton uh, areas up on top. Well, these play really big roles in the, the habitat or the, the ecology of these Humboldt squid. During the night, they come up to the surface. Like I said, there's these really great habitats or ecosystems up on top. They're eating everything that they want. Life is good. But then the sun comes up, and then, you know, that's a bad thing for some things. We have all of these predators that come out, visual predators, that can now see what's happening. Like white tip oceanic sharks, uh, billfishes, tuna, and like that. And to escape these visual predators, these... Uh, these squid are going to move down to the oxygen minimum zone, where they're physi physiologically adapted to do well, that these other predators cannot follow, because they have too high of an oxygen demand, they can't survive down there very long, so they move down to escape their major predators into the oxygen minimum zone. Which means that they only really do well and thrive where we have this oxygen minimum zone that, that is healthy and, and doing well. If we look at oxygen at about 200 meters depth across the entire Earth, what you're seeing here, these blue areas, are these oxygen minimum zones. So again, off, our, off the west coast of North and South America, we have them going up the coast, they kind of come out like this, and then they move uh, somewhat further up, but they dissipate pretty, pretty quickly, going northward, but these are expanding. They're getting larger. And it appears, although this isn't really conclusive, that even small changes in sea surface temperatures do a couple things. We strengthen the, the pycnocline, and so there's even less mixing between the surface and down below, and then even small changes in this temperature can cause a lot more growth of plankton. And so those two factors seem to be enhancing the conditions to create oxygen minimum zones. And so what we're seeing is this oxygen minimum zone creeping northward. The other thing that I want you to kind of notice is look at the shape of that oxygen minimum zone. Look again at the shape of the, the distribution of Humboldt squid, and it is very, very closely matched. So, so how is this occurring? We're, okay, so they're moving forward, but, or northward, but how is that happening? And we kind of take a look a little bit here at some hypotheses about that. The leading hypothesis at the moment about what's going on is that during uh, fall months, when the pycnocline, or when this uh, oxygen minimum zone expands the most, because it expands seasonally, it goes northward every year and then comes down a little bit, it goes northward because we have 
changes in the amount of um, phytoplankton that's living at any given time. The idea is that as we get this upward and downward shift that we have squid that are occurring down here in their native range and they will seasonally come north and then hang out up here for a time because we actually have a lot more animals living in the ocean up north than they do down south so they're going to come up you're going to take advantage of the, the greater food sources but then once we start having the receding of the oxygen minimum zone they will recede back down south and we get kind of this pulsing effect that doesn't happen every year, but when conditions are right, we get this pulsing up of these squid and then moving back down. So, with all that background, the questions I was really interested in is, so what's the nature? Is that really what's happening? Is that the nature of these northward migrations of these squid? Do they form these cohesive shoals down their historic range like we've all kind of thought and then just move up together like a big happy family? and move back down, or is there something more complicated happening? And then the other thing is, where are they really coming from? Are they coming from the northern end of their historic range? Or are they coming from somewhere else? Are they coming from, you know, way far south? Are they coming from out in the Pacific more? Where are they coming from? We don't really know. It's hard to, we haven't had any good studies that can track them over a long period of time. Tags tend to fall off quickly. We've had tagging sites that go out to a couple weeks, but really that's the best we got. Not really a lot of good stuff. So I was curious, can we start using stable isotopes to answer some of these questions? Now there have been some previous studies of stable isotopes, not using archival tissues, but just using metabolically active tissues to try to see what do their recent stable isotope um, signatures look like in a given area. There's been two really large surveys that have really helped me out quite a bit. Uh, published in 2012, right before I was finishing up my own work here. And what we found in those is that there's actually a really nice, robust latitudinal pattern of both carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes. And so we have this really nice um, geographic pattern that we can draw off of and compare to, to really see where are they kind of coming from. And then also what we found out about this is when they're looking at... Um, the recent stable isotopes, when they're looking at the variation, a lot of it can be explained by geographic location. Uh, this one particular study could, could uh, account for 70% of the carbon isotope variation. And of that that they could explain, they could explain 90% due to location. And I really think, uh, looking at their methods, that a good amount of the rest of the 70 or the 30 um, or 23% that they couldn't explain had to do with a couple procedural things, that they weren't actually accounting for all the possible geographic signal that was there. They were leaving a couple big things out. So what we did, what I did in this study, was I took uh, Humboldt squid islands that we collected in Oregon, Washington, California, and British Columbia during 2008 and 2009. We had a very large mass migration up in those years, and we had thousands of them littering the shores in places like Seaside, Oregon, um, in, or excuse me, Seaside, Oceanside, Washington, Seaside, Oregon. They gotta name these. <laughs> I'm gonna get them confused. You spend too much time in like little seaside towns and they start getting all good. Anyhow, um, and we also have some in British Columbia showing up. I was able to get samples from all those and those mass migrations and start uh, to see what's going on with those. We sampled their lenses, and what we were able to do is we were able to get lens layer groups. So, and about 35 to 40 of those per island. Now, the great thing about this, if they're only living a year, and these are about equal size compared to their size at the time of formation, this is resolution somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 days per uh, layer group that we're looking at, or slightly better. And so we're able to get a pretty good resolution of what's happening with these, with these squid. Also, and so then we went through, we did stable isotope um, analysis of each of these lens layers for each of these squid. It turned out to be thousands upon thousands of samples that were our individual lens layers that we're looking at. Uh, I think total we had somewhere in the neighborhood of um, 20 squid from each location, 60, about 60 squid altogether that we're looking at. So we had a pretty good sample size here. And what we did was we were able to compare the patterns going from the center so the very earliest uh, layers laid down out to, the, out to the outermost ring that was most recent, 
compare the patterns of the changes in these stable isotopes over that time to kind of compare them to each other. And essentially what this is giving us is their history. Where have they been and what have they been eating historically? And then also, we can compare the innermost layers. So the very center part of the lens was laid down when these animals were very, very young and hasn't been changed since that point. And so this should tell us a lot about where they were born, where they were at when they were very small. And we were able to do some nice things with that. First off, we calculated the distance. Essentially, um, we take the different changes in all of these eye lenses from early on to late in their life, and we essentially subtract all the different values that to try to find what is the distance between them, called the Euclidean distance of all the different delta 13c values for these eye lenses. Again, we're primarily using delta 13c in this case because it doesn't have that enrichment factor with trophic level. It gives you a better idea of where they're at rather than what they've been eating and where their trophic level is at. And we perform some hierarchical clustering on those to try to see, okay, now which one of these look most similar in their stable isotope signature to what other squid? How do these cluster together? And if they all basically eating the same thing, start out in Mexico all together and come up as a big happy group and eating the same you know, stuff that they encounter as they go along, we should expect all the ones in the different sampling locations to look more like the ones we caught them with than any of the other ones. But if something else is happening, if they come up in the group, they get in a fight, anthropomorphizing a little bit, giving me a little slide here. Uh, they, the group breaks up, this one goes joins this group, and goes a different way, that one goes joins it. And so we have a lot of fragmentation in these shoals. We wouldn't necessarily see that. The histories of each of these individual squid or groups of these squid will be different than other ones that we found in those groups. So I'm going to show you the results of this. I'm going to show you a tree, kind of a downward tree, that clusters them together by most similar to each other. And I'm going to mark them just by their sampling location. So white in California, uh, gray for Oregon, Washington, black for British Columbia. And again, if they're coming up in a cohesive group, we should see all the colors kind of clustering together. And this is what we actually saw. A complete mishmash. Nothing looked like anything else. And, and let me draw your attention to a couple of these. These two little groups here, some of the squid that we caught in British Columbia in their carbon stable, stable isotope signature looked more like ones that we caught in California, hundreds of miles south, than ones that we caught right next to them. So it does not appear that there's this, for at least from this evidence, that there's really strong, uh, long, stable relationships between these, these shoals. There's something more complicated going on. Okay, so that, that's kind of interesting in itself right there, but let's, let's move on here. Now let's take a look at these average values of the lens layers at the very center of the lens. So these are going to be reflecting where they came from at birth. And again, the standing hypothesis is that these are going to be coming from Mexico and South. And they're only coming up very late in life to take advantage of all of our, you know, goodies up here and the waters up here, and going back. And we're looking at layers of about 2.4 millimeters and smaller. The reason that we're doing that is because at that size of islands, according to the scaling of their body, their mantle length should only be about 8 centimeters and less. And squid that small can't fight the current. They're going wherever the current takes them. So they shouldn't really be migrating anywhere at that size. They might be carried somewhere by the water, but um, they're not going to be migrating, per se. And then we compared these to those two other good latitudinal surveys that we got. So we have these other surveys that have, we have a really good idea of what the stable isotope variation is from north to south. So we can compare the very center of their eyes, what they were like at birth, to what we would expect Humboldt squid to look like over this entire range. So, first off, I'm going to show you a plot like this. I'm going to give you the delta 13c values on the y-axis. Latitude, so going from south to north this way on the x-axis. And each one of these lines, that might be a little bit hard to uh, tell what's going on here, but what we see here is each one of these lines is the range of values that was found in carbon stable isotope signature 
at each of these latitudes going north along the coast. So the nice thing is here, just to add like a little regression line here to give you kind of an idea of the pattern, we have a good pattern that they don't, well, there's overlap in the middle here, there's not necessarily overlap at the, at the ends. So we, we have some sort of idea about certain values that can only come from certain places. So let's take a look at the average for the ones, the, the center of the islands is that we got from British Columbia was pretty low. It is lower than negative 18 delta 13 C, which is very low. And the ones that we collected from Oregon, even lower than that. The ones we collected from California, even lower than that. So what we're seeing here is that really, with, with the exception of a few gaps that we're having in here, really we're, we're expecting them to come from in this area right here. These stable isotope values only agree with what we found about 37 degrees in north, and then somewhere below the equator. So it kind of looks like they're either being born in this region down here, or this region right up here. If we look at delta 15 or delta 15n, which is not as good in this case to compare, but at least we can compare and make sure our, our, our other values basically look right, they kind of agree. Again, we're getting uh, values that make sense in those same two regions. So, okay, nothing too crazy is going on. So geographically, let's take a look at where that's at. This is their, their home range, so again, we're kind of expecting them to come through here. But to mark off the latitudinal ranges that matched where we found our isotopes at, are, is this. Really far down here, south of the equator, and then kind of up here. And in fact, there's been some physiological studies recently done to try to determine, was the northern, hypothetically, was the northernmost latitude physiologically that they could hatch at? And this red line is it. So physiologically, if you go a little offshore, actually, there is conditions that they could potentially hatch in. So, this, this is kind of, I don't want to be too strong about this at all, but there's kind of uh, some, a little bit of evidence here that they might be actually hatching, at least in this cohort that we looked at, farther north than their historic range. Which for a big predator like this, that travels in really huge groups, is it potentially could have some big repercussions for the, the ecosystems that they're moving into. So... And, and one thing I want to know, looking at how fast they migrate per day, there's essentially no way they could really come down from here. If they took off the moment they were born, beelining it straight for the Pacific Northwest, because, hey, you know, who doesn't want to come to the Pacific Northwest as soon as they're born? I would. If they left immediately, they could barely get up here by the time they die. They have a short lifespan, and they're not moving incredibly fast. So this does not seem very likely. So all together, what is this kind of telling us? First off, they appear to be born north of 37 north. Um, and, and physiological sites, especially slightly offshore, appear to support hatching of up to about 43 north. So there's a window in there that at least matches the stable isotope signatures that we're seeing here. And, and we can at least hypothesize they may be being born up here. And I just only want to put this out there as a hypothesis, not like a firm conclusion. Because really, there's a lot of other evidence that needs to be put together before we can actually start saying, hey, they, this might be a problem. And then it also doesn't hear that they're seeing that they're forming this coherent shoal and moving all together as a group. And there's actually some other short-term tagging studies where they've tagged them all in one place, release them again, they go other places, and it, it doesn't, um, that doesn't seem. However, I won't talk too much about it. That could have been northern origin if... They all were born here, moved around, ended up here. You wouldn't expect them all to, to group together like that. And kind of just stepping back to my original kind of idea here is that this is kind of also adding to the idea that stable isotope analysis, especially of cephalopod islands, is this archival tissue that we have, could be a really powerful tool to help us get out a lot of that information about cephalopods and their life history that has, up until now, in a lot of ways, been very difficult to collect and, and kind 
kind of thing close to us. So really, um, just to kind of finish up here, give uh, acknowledgments of all the people that helped out with this. All this work was done at Washington State University as I was doing my doctoral work there, under my advisor, Dr. Ray Lee. I had an army of undergraduates helping me pill eye lenses and prep them for statewide isotope analysis, because again, I probably could have sat down the moment I got there and worked my entire time, my entire five years on my PhD program, and not prepped all the samples that these guys did. So they, they were absolutely essential to this. Uh, eye lens collection, I did do all myself. I had collaborators at uh, Bill Gilly at URI, Brad Seibel, or excuse me, Ron Gilly at uh, Stanford, Brad Seibel at URI, um, Bob Legoff of WEF and W right here in Washington, and Grant Gillespie of uh, the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and had a couple good funding sources, both internally from Washington State, but really, oh, my wife was an absolute saint through all this because I had dead, rotting squid in our trunk, and she was okay with that. <laughs> and she actually went with me to go grab them. I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that regard. Also, before I leave, I just need to plug a little bit. I'm now at Walla Walla University as an assistant professor there. And I just want to say that, can I give a little plug? You can get a master's of science in biology at, at Walla, or Walla Walla University. We operate a really nice uh, marine station. We have a good group of biologists there doing a lot of good research handling, uh, putting up here some stuff on sea cucumbers, isopods, some behavior of glaucous wing gulls. Um, my stuff, I'm moving into looking at octopus responses to ocean acidification, which is another kind of um, emergent, like, big problem in ocean ecosystems, but we have a tissue engineer, some people doing immunology on cancer, and honestly, we have almost an embarrassingly late application deadline, so you can actually still apply for next year if any of the students are graduating and interested, you can go biology.wawa.edu, and plug our marine station as well. During the summer, we, we uh, have classes out there uh, that you can go and take come back here after you're done with that, and, and we're having a like behavior of marine organisms going on out there, marine inverse class, a few other things, but if you're interested in that, rosario.wallawall.edu is a good place, and I'm going to leave that up because it's really nice to look at a sunny day on the ocean as you. So with that, I'll take any questions.